Over the centuries, and continuing into today, the greatest harm to societies has been imposed by those who hold the irrational beliefs of fundamentalist religious teachings. Those few individuals who have had the courage to confront these beliefs have been punished, and their rational thinking and actions have been among the most severely suppressed and persecuted. I believe that those few who speak out and take action deserve our greatest respect and admiration. Because of this, I started the annual Henry H. Zumach Award for Freedom from Religious Fundamentalism. After giving the Zumach Award to the Freedom from Religion Foundation in 2016, we worked out the details for FFRF to permanently administer the award. We established an investment fund that I financed. In 2017 and 2018, I contributed $100,000 to the fund. A, a, a portion of the award goes to the recipient, and my hope is that the amount of the award will gradually increase into the future. And Annie Laurie, uh, I will be contributing another $100,000 this week. I thought I'd give her something to talk about. <laughs> Here is Annie Laurie to introduce this year's winner. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Hank. What can I say? We're, we're odd. Um, it's my pleasure to get to meet and introduce Rachel Laser. We met her this morning. She's the new president and CEO of Americans United. Rachel is the first time they've had a, a woman, the first time they've had a non-Christian. She is a lawyer, an advocate, a strategist who's dedicated her career to making our nation more inclusive. As a member of a religious minority group, raised as a Reformed Jew, she understands personally how important it is for our nation to have equal protection under the law. She previously served as Deputy Director of the Religious Action Center for Re Reform Judaism, and previous to that, she directed the Culture Program at Third Way. It's a progressive think tank in DC where she launched Come, Let Us Reason Together. It's an initiative to mobilize evangelical Christians and liberals to work together on critical issues such as women's reproductive freedom and LGBTQ equality. She drafted the first common ground abortion bill to be introduced jointly by the anti-abortion and pro-choice members of Congress and served as senior counsel at the National Women's Law Center where she founded the Pharmacy Refusal Project to challenge pharmacists who refuse to fill women's birth control prescriptions. She's a graduate of Harvard and the University of Chicago Law School and she serves on the National Board of Pro-Choice America, and thank you so much, Rachel, for lending your talents to separation of state and church and joining us today, so come on up. On behalf of Americans United, our dedicated and talented staff back in Washington, D.C., our board of trustees, our volunteer leaders, and our 300,000 supporters across the country, thank you so much for this award. It's an honor for AU to receive the Henry H. Zumach Freedom from Religious Fundamentalism Award, and especially meaningful for me to receive it on our behalf after having dinner last night with Hank and Betty. I'm also thrilled to have the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you today on how to protect and defend our cherished principle of separation of religion and government during these precarious times. So I thought I'd start by sharing just a little bit more about myself. Uh, as you just heard, I'm Jewish, and I grew up not so far away in Chicago. I attended the oldest synagogue in the Midwest. It's called KAM Isaiah Israel. 
And I went to KAM Sunday School because my bet, it's called Sunday School, we went on Sundays, because my best friend started going and I asked my parents if I could go too. Even though we lived on the north side of Chicago, my parents joined this reform synagogue on the south side because they loved the intellectual and progressive rabbi. His name was Arnold Jacob Wolf, and they liked the idea of being part of the University of Chicago community. Over the years, my parents made many friends at KAM, and by the time I graduated from law school, the temple offered my dad the role of temple president. He accepted. Wanting to honor my dad and uncertain how, I bought him two things that he didn't already have. A mezuzah to hang outside of his front door and a crocheted kippah to wear when he sat up on the bima during services. My dad would have none of either. He asked me to please return them both to the temple gift shop. I did. My dad is one of many Jewish atheists I know, right? And he's also one of the most principled moral people I know. But that's certainly, yeah, yay for Gary Lazar. But that's certainly not how the majority of the country sees atheists. So today, I'll begin by sharing some observations about our country's growing disdain for non-theists. Then I'll discuss what's at the heart of this disdain, fearful clinging to a religious and predominantly Christian norm. And then we'll take a moment to look at how this is manifesting. I'll conclude by sharing some strategies borrowed from the marriage equality movement to change the social norm so that America can make good on its promise of true religious freedom for all. So I know I don't have to tell you all that atheists are, shall we say, out of favor today in America. Just the other day, one of our donors called to tell me he was bequeathing us a very large gift. I asked him how he connects to our issue. He explained that he's from the South, and when his dad died, he was the one his dad had designated as the executor of the estate. His brothers and sisters didn't like that, and they used his atheism to discredit him on the stand in court. This past weekend, as we've just been talking about, the Attorney General of the United States blamed our country's violence, mental illness, ongoing drug epidemic, and quote, wreckage of the family problems on, quote, the growing ascendancy of secularism. You all might know already that Americans are less willing to elect an atheist for president than any other category of candidate. And are you familiar with this one? A poll conducted this summer by PRRI, a nonpartisan public opinion research firm, shows that nearly one quarter of Americans say small businesses should be allowed to refuse to serve atheists if doing so is against their religious beliefs. This support has climbed nearly 10 percentage points since 2014, just four years ago. Hmm, I wonder what's been going on these past four years. Here's an oversimplified three-part answer. First, starting in 2014, white Christians ceased being the majority in America. Add to that, <laughs> add to that the first black president, the rapid movement towards LGBTQ equality, the hashtag MeToo movement, the fast rise of the religiously unaffiliated, or the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, and the fact that America will be majority black and brown by 2046. This all has engendered great fear among white Christians, particularly vested in traditional power structures. Second, President Trump, playing off of that fear, promised his white Christian voting base that he would make America great again, meaning restore their perceived loss of power. 
And third, given Trump's promise and follow through, Trump's base have never felt more emboldened to say or do anything and everything to preserve their power, which includes squashing especially those who are challenging it the most. And that's why atheists get such special treatment. What, who, what else is this kowtowing president and the fearful group of Americans doing to preserve their power? Unapologetically doubling down on keeping American symbols, rituals, and rhetoric religious and Christian. So just this past weekend, we saw that trifecta that we just discussed, Attorney General Barr saying what he did, I just read, read it about secularists, Trump declaring that Americans will, quote, forever and always believe in the eternal glory of God, right? And Secretary Pompeo bragging about how his Christianity informs his decision making and then posting his, quote, being a Christian leader speech on the official State Department website. But this crusade has reached far beyond the Trump-Pence administration. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the Supreme Court's misguided decision earlier this year allowing the 40-foot towering Bladensburg Cross to remain on public land in Maryland. I'm guessing you too agree with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's statement that, quote, when a cross is displayed on public property, the government may be presumed to endorse its religious content. The court, however, ruled seven justices to two that government may prominently display and endorse this Christian symbol because it's a historical custom. In other words, it's okay to violate the constitutional right to religious freedom for all Americans if we've always done it that way. We've seen some recent losses in the federal courts as well. In August, a federal appeals court ruled against our clients in Pennsylvania, allowing the state House of Representatives to bar atheists from giving invocations before the legislature. Citing Bladensburg, the court appealed to history, saying that legislative prayer invoking God is an American tradition. And in Congress, we are seeing the same type of religious traditions remain intact. Representative Jared Huffman, the only atheist member of our 535 members of Congress, recently lost his battle to make the so help me God part of the oath optional for witnesses testifying before his committee. All it seemed to have taken was Representative Liz Cheney declaring that Democrats, quote, really have become the party of Karl Marx to make the Democrats back down and leave the rule in place. How absurd is it that any scientist testifying before the Committee on Natural Resources would be required to swear to God or be disqualified? It's as though we're gearing up for another full-fledged 1950s movement, moment, the decade when fear of communism led the government to infuse our culture, like Andrew was saying, including our national motto, Pledge of Allegiance, and money, with an unprecedented level of religiosity. Or perhaps you think we're already there. Some people say it's hopeless to challenge social norms around religion right now. They tell us not to devote time to cases like Bladensburg Cross and to stick to the more winnable and substantive battles like preventing religious refusals in the realm of health care and employment. Yes, those fights are critical and we at AU are certainly engaging in them, but we cannot and must not give up on fighting for an inclusive baseline. The reason is simple. We will not achieve our country's promise of true religious freedom until non-theists, the non-religious, and religious minorities are as accepted as Christians. That deserves applause. 
Our founders understood this profoundly, even back in the late 1700s, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which is widely viewed as the foundation for the First Amendment's commitment to religious freedom, he said that its aim was to protect, quote, the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mahometan, the Hindu, and note, he included, the infidel of every denomination. <laughs> Back in the 1700s. We know we cannot give up on the fight to change the baseline around religion to make it inclusive for all. So the question is, how are we going to get there? And here's what I know for sure. It's not going to be easy. It's not a five or 10 year project, and it's a hard question to answer. But I would like to suggest that the marriage equality movement, which changed deeply embedded social norms around the institution of marriage in just one generation, offers us not just inspiration, but some excellent strategic lessons. In 1988, when the General Society survey first asked, only 11.6% of respondents said they thought same-sex couples should have the right to marry. But by 2018, just 30 years later, the number of Americans who said same-sex couples should have the right to marry was at 68%. Social scientists say that it's rare for public opinion to change this much and this quickly, but it did. How? Having worked on this issue quite extensively as a straight ally throughout some of this critical period, three key strategies come to mind. One is to have those who are not the norm come out. Public opinion research solidly demonstrates that knowing someone who is openly LGBTQ changes hearts and minds more than anything else. The LGBTQ equality movement did a phenomenal job of not only encouraging people to come out, but also creating a better climate in which to do so. TV shows like Will and Grace and Grey's Anatomy included LGBTQ characters and celebrities from Ellen to George Michael to Melissa Etheridge started coming out or being outed right and left. Still, it took a huge number of brave LGBTQ people who were willing to put their relationships, family, livelihood, safety, and even lives on the line to create this change. Our equivalent is to keep encouraging non-Christians and the non-religious, but particularly non-theists, to speak up about their religious identities or non-identities. We also need to ensure that celebrities are doing the same and popular culture is casting people in the role of lovable atheists and developing characters who don't affiliate with any religious tradition. FFRF continues to do excellent work with the Out of the Closet campaign, but we need to make a lot more noise. I challenge everyone here to share your own belief system with someone back at home when you leave this conference. But don't just do so with like-minded people. The strategy here is also to tell your friends, family, and communities who may have different beliefs. The more buzz we create about the existence of non-theists and the non-religious, and with the growing numbers of this segment of the population, more buzz should be doable, the more welcoming the environment is for others to come out too. I want to acknowledge, however, that like with outing yourself as an LGBTQ person, it can be extremely difficult and even life-threatening to out yourself as a non-theist in certain parts of this country. For this, for this reason, sadly, many of Americans United's plaintiffs must still remain anonymous to stay safe. It takes courage and it takes risk. A second key strategy of the marriage equality movement was to normalize not just being LGBTQ, but having romantic same-sex relationships. That is what I'll nickname the go for the jugular strategy because it went directly to one of the most vulnerable spots for straight people, losing the privilege that attaches to our opposite sex relationships. Popular movies like Brokeback Mountain and Call Me By Your Name portrayed gay relationships in ways that were relatable, 
and relatably sensual for straight people. TV shows began to include not just LGBTQ people, but gay and lesbian relationships. I would argue that our go for the jugular equivalent is to go to where there is enormous privilege, enormous privilege for religious people, the realm of moral superiority. Our efforts must engage popular culture, not just in having non-theist and non-religious characters, but in conveying that non-theists and non-religious people are as moral and principled as religious people are. Some may be tempted to portray non-theists and the non-religious as having better morals and principles than religious people. But, but, even if you think that's true, hear me out. The marriage equality success teaches it's a bad idea. A critical third strategy of the marriage equality movement was to speak to and enlist those considered the norm. So in that case, opposite sex married people. The way to opposite sex married people's hearts was not to tell them that same sex marriages were better than their marriages, <laughs> even if some thought they were. It was to tell them that same-sex couples wanted to join their institution. What did join mean to opposite-sex married people? Public opinion research revealed that opposite-sex married people associated marriage most with commitment, and hence a campaign was born around conveying that same-sex marriage was about commitment too. Moreover, opposite-sex married couples, often parents or grandparents of LGBTQ people, were important spokespeople for moving the country towards full acceptance of marriage equality. The equivalent for us is speaking to and enlisting religious leaders, but particularly Christians, who are still 65% of the country in advocating for the right to be religious or non-religious without assigning moral superiority to either. We must speak to people of faith in a shared language and appeal to their commitment to religious freedom and the Constitution. This third strategy is where Americans United is uniquely positioned to help. The truth is, there aren't many places where the secular and faith communities intentionally come together. But since our founding, AU has been uniting these two communities around the shared goal of church-state separation. In fact, since I joined AU, I've noticed that our two most passionate groups of supporters are people who have a strong tie to their faith community and strong non-theists because both groups deeply value their religious identities and understand how important separating religion and government is to them. I was particularly happy when, earlier this year, Jim Winkler, the president of the National Council of Churches, an ecumenical partnership of 38 Christian faith groups in the US, became a trustee of Americans United. And he joined one of the country's preeminent atheist advocates, Eddie Tabash, in serving on our board. <laughs> Friends, let's not lose hope. Someday, we're all going to have clean money in our pockets. You all know what I mean by that, right? Because. The Constitution is on our side because the demographics around religion in our country are changing and because we are smart and strategic, committed and brave. Again, it's a true honor to accept this award on behalf of Americans United. We are so happy to have FFRF as partners in today's unreal struggle for freedom and democracy. Thank you.
Um, I think that the staff here is going to be bringing a few chairs in while we're doing the questions because we have a conversation coming up with Sarah Vowell. So just ignore that. <laughs> and Rachel Laser is happy to take some questions. There won't be a lot of time, maybe one or two. You can um, line up there. And please ask a question briefly. Rahul from New Jersey. Uh, thank you, first of all. Uh, what do you think about Mayor Buttigieg's attempt to kind of make religion and speaking to religion part of his campaign? Well, I really, I have appreciated so far the way M Mayor Pete has talked about how inappropriate it is to misuse religion to discriminate. I think he's called that out, and I think he has an important platform, right, because he's both outwardly identified as LGBTQ and a person of faith. So I think he's in a really powerful position to be able to make that clear. I have not heard him being exclusionary. Um, you know, I have not, uh, my red alert is always up as a, as a Jew, you know, and I'm always sort of listening <laughs> for that mm -hmm. or I hear it mm -hmm. because I can't help it. Um, but I have appreciated the way he has called out what has really been we all know part of a sad history in our country, which is the misuse of religion to maintain traditional power structures and turn back the, cl the clock on progress and equality for all. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Robert, I'm from Ohio, and um, I'm an Episcopalian and have been one for all my life. Uh, my current partner is a Unitarian who is non-theist, but my last partner was an Episcopal priest who died after almost 30 years. And I have spent a lot of this conference wondering why I'm here, but after your speech, I don't. So thank you. Thank you. Regarding the people who won't bake cakes for some of the public, and they won't take wedding photos for some of the public. They won't host wedding events for some of the public. What's your opinion on boycott? Boycotts are great. Uh, I would go beyond boycotts to lawsuits. Um, I, uh, both are great. <laughs> um, you know, the thing is, um, a couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, as a general principle, America is an intentionally diverse country in so many ways, right? And we are certainly, as we've talked about, and as you all know, a very intentionally religiously diverse country. So how is this amazing experiment supposed to work and not blow up if in our shared public spaces we are using our religion to harm one another, right? It doesn't work, right? So that's principle number one. But as a legal matter, right, when, for example, with the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, when the people of Colorado have passed a public accommodations law saying you can't discriminate against LGBTQ people, and a baker is taking it upon himself to carve out his own little religious exemption to discriminate against a gay couple, right, and the state's letting that happen, then the state is privileging that baker's religion over the gay couple's religion and over the religious beliefs of the state of Colorado, of the people of the state of Colorado. And that is a violation of church state separation legally. And so that belongs in court. Now, unfortunately, um, and I have a lot to say about this. The master, I will make it very short though. The Masterpiece Cake Shop decision was a confusing one that came down from the Supreme Court. Technically, we lost, um, but the court decision also said that businesses must be open to all. So it was like a very um, ambiguous decision. But what I, wanna, what I wanna say is the most, in my view, the most dangerous part of that decision was when the court said, that there was animus towards religion when the Colorado Civil Rights Commissioner in the hearing below called out this truth that religion has so often across history been used to discriminate like here, even in the cases of slavery and the Holocaust. That truth that he spoke is a loaded, a loaded and heated truth 
But the fact that he chose to say that truth is not animus towards religion. And that sets an incredibly dangerous precedent for us all in calling out the truth about the misuse of religion to discriminate. So that was a very upsetting part of the decision that I thought I'd share with you all after I left you on a positive note. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yep. Uh, so Yes, I'm Carolyn from Hawaii, and after 18 years of fighting for social justice for my gay son and all my LGBTIAQ friends, I thank you for making the connection with our challenge today. And we need not just to see it as a challenge, but as a fight. We have to go in there prepared for bear, as they say in the North, and I think, I think we're ready, and I know we're up to it. Last night, wandering the, the, the grounds, we ran into another couple, and I asked if they were coming to this convention today, because we didn't have our tags yet, and they said yes. And I said, well, I think we all have to come out, and that was the theme we carried away from the, the elevator was that now is the time for us to come out. So I hear that reflected in both first speakers. And I thank you, and I think we better arm ourselves because this will be the fight of our life. Thank you. Another round of applause, please, for Rachel. Thank you so much. Thank you.